Okay, so um, now it's uh, a reminder this is tax day. For those of you who might still have that to do, um, assignment H for the availability window is until Wednesday at 11 59 p.m. So, for those of you still um, who haven't turned into assignment H, you have some time to do that. Um, assignment uh, ZB, which is the um, final exam review assignment that's just over post midterm topics, is available. Um, that is one that you can take multiple times. It'll keep the highest score. It draws randomly from banks of questions for each of the post midterm units. Um, assignment CA practice is also available for those of you who want to practice topics from before the midterm. That also draws randomly. Um, the score doesn't count for anything, um, so you can take it as many times as you'd like. Uh, but uh, so it's basically a mimic of the thing you took before the midterm. Uh, there is one last reading for the class for this upcoming Thursday. It's a short chapter from Walker and Salt um, on sort of design systems for sustainability. Um, otherwise, the way the schedule will go next week is that Tuesday is a final exam review. Uh, Wednesday, the projects are due. Um, it's sort of the initial form uploaded to, to Canvas. Um, Thursday will be stage one of the final exam. Um, Saturday will be when the peer reviews are due for the final projects. Each one of you will be assigned uh, three projects to review. Um, there'll be a little rubric that you click on some numbers for and provide some short feedback. It doesn't have to be very long, but just constructive feedback. And then I believe it is Tuesday final exam week when we'll have stage two. Uh, stage one and stage two are set up exactly like the midterm two stage exam. So same length. So there's length of the midterm. Um, and uh, same number of sheets, you know, formula sheets that you have available. Stage one is a uh, individual exam. Stage two is a group exam. Uh, stage uh, one is uh, requires respondents locked down browser with a camera. Stage two um, is you can uh, sort of free to use, like there's so there's no respondents requirement. Uh, stage uh, one, all you get is your note sheet. Stage two. You get sort of everything on Canvas, as well as the um, you know any text that I've provided in your course notes, and you can collaborate with anybody who's currently enrolled in the class, just like the midterm. Um, only other thing is April twenty fourth coming up. Uh, as posted on Canvas, there is for five points of reading exercise credit. There is an event. Um, I think six p.m. webinar. You have to register to get the Zoom link, um, and it is a webinar about. Um, whether plants are intelligent. So if you look at the physiology of plants, uh, then and it's sort of meant for a broad audience. So there's an expert on this, and they'll begin to ask questions about, you know, are plants processing information in sort of an intelligent way that goes beyond just normal physiological functions? Are plants sort of behaving in a way? Can we use things like information to try to quantify how ants? Uh, and it's how, it's how plants um, uh, you know, go about responding to stimuli from the environment. And then the other thing is course evaluations are available. Uh, they will be available until Thursday, April 27th at 11.59 p.m. Um, I don't know why they don't give you through Friday. I think it's because maybe a lot of people maybe give exams uh, you know, on special periods on Fridays or something. I, I'm not quite sure, but it's not the whole last week of courses. It's just that Thursday. So I think those are all of the kind of announcements and structures. Any questions on the timeline? Yeah. So what's the um, the availability with those for each of the stages? Um, yo, right. So um, nominally, uh, stage one, I'll do Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, I guess I could scribble that here. Um, so stage one, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and nominally stage two. Um, at I would say at least. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but I'm uh, considering it probably will just extend it to do the whole exam week because uh, I don't really need that much time to review those before posting grades. Any other questions? If you um, have, uh, I'll see that sitting in a second. If you do happen to be submitting an honors contract submission for this course, um, it would be great if you could get it to me the Friday of finals week so I at least have over the weekend to review that. Um, so for the, the stage two, the final exam, are we allowed to like look at sources from the from the class, like the readings? Or? Yeah, anything that I've assigned, including readings. So 
any of the course textbooks, any of the course notes, any of the notes I've provided, any notes you've taken. I just don't want you, and you know, and I, I'm sort of trusting you about this. I don't want you to go sort of Googling. So for Wikipedia or Course Hero or anything else like that. So as long as I've provided you the source or it's linked um, or provided on Canvas, then that's fair game. Or if you've taken notes, that's fair. Anything else? Okay, great. So um, before we jump into networks, and there is a close connection between the game theory and the network stuff. Um, I did, you know, we didn't quite get through hot dub, and I want to make sure we cover that um, to sort of clarify things. And that also gives me an opportunity to sort of summarize that, um, you know, so when we talked about the uh, stag hunt, uh, which is an example of an assurance game. Um, which is, you know, also happens to be a coordination game, but an assurance game is a very special type of a coordination game. And the point behind the stag hunt here is that it is um, better for, um, every, for everyone if more, more, Uh, people choose the stag option or resource. And it is uh, particularly better for um, those who choose stag. So it's better for everybody but it is particularly better for those who choose stag. So once you have enough people choosing stag, then it provides a public good that benefits everyone playing the game, but particularly those who are playing stag. And so if you could manage to get everyone in the game to play stag, that would be a great option. Um, but, um, but the problem is that because the reward depends on the number of people playing stag, there's always a worry that uh, there will be so many people not playing stag that you'll end up not getting that much of a benefit. You'll pay a cost to, you know, to go for the stag option when in the end you could just sit back and be totally fine with the hair option. In fact, you might even be slightly better off if other people are playing stag. So the uh, problem is that you have no assurance that's why it's an assurance game, that enough people will play stag to make it worth it. And so then hair is the safer option. And that's the key element of assurance games. Um, and so, you know, this maps to public good problems. And so, like, you can think like public radio, maybe, um, maybe um, uh, once upon a time, maybe like, you know, higher education provided by the state, um, those sorts of things, maybe I'll put higher ed question mark. Um, et cetera. So the idea here is that in public goods, you can't provide a public good without some people contributing. So somebody in society has to pay for the public good. Once enough people have paid for the public good, everyone in society gets some benefit. So society would benefit if everyone contributed to the public good. But if people have the option to contribute or not contribute to the public good, then you're always going to get some large section of people who just decide not to contribute to the public good. And because they might be okay without it, and any sort of side benefits, any extra positive externalities are just kind of icing on the cake. So, um, so I should also mention, you know, mention this is, so this is, you know, where you get extreme positive externalities. So one way, um, you know, what, what's one way we can get everyone paying for public goods? Anybody has a guess at that? 
which relates to the day. Yeah, taxes. Taxes, right? So that's you know one one option here is that if if you uh, if you if you fund a public good through taxes, that is one way of resolving this problem. Because if everyone in the society has agreed that that thing's good, but nobody wants to be the one who says, I want to pay for that, then you can have a central government say, okay, you're all going to pay for that. And we know it all benefits you. And as long as we don't charge you too much for it, then everyone maybe will be okay with that. Um, but of course, you know, that may not be sustainable. And that's largely what's happened in higher ed. So, you know, higher ed. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, they did a survey a couple of years ago, and a lot of people think that the public, like government support of higher ed has stayed uh, flat or gone up in the last 10 years. Turns out it's gone down significantly. And that's the reason why you see like your tuition goes up and things like that. Is that gradually, as you get less state support for higher ed, it then forces um, a, what used to be a public good to turn into a private good. So what used to be something that, you know, it was a benefit to educate society, now it is a privilege to those who pay for it. So it's gradually turning all, you know, public schools into private schools. And that's just the decisions that taxpayers made, that that was their choice, is that it wasn't that you really view it as a public good. And so um, that's the other way you solve public goods problems, is you just make it private, you know, goods. You just make it that the only person who gets the benefit is the one who pay. That's the difference between public radio and XM satellite radio. Only people who contribute to XM satellite radio get the XM stations. And that's how they provide their own high quality content. They don't have to worry about freeloaders, right? So, um, so that's, that's how the stag hunt is a model for positive externalities and public goods. Um, so the key thing that I'm highlighting here in contrast to the hawk dove is that it is better for more people to play stag to get involved. So that's what makes it a positive externality is that you want, you want the, with every person who plays stag, you generate more benefits for everyone else. So any questions about that? I know there were some questions in the Muddiest Points. Um, this is, I'm just trying to answer some of those here. I've also tried to answer those directly in some of the responses. Does that make sense? Right, so we can contrast that with hawk dove um, or uh, chicken. And so uh, before writing out the payoff matrix, then the focus here is a problem where um, you want fewer people to use the resource. So here, more people using the resource degrades the value or the benefit um, to those using it. And so this is um, what we refer to as a negative externality. And so the core problem um, is that um, each individual once the benefit, but benefit degrades with uh, more individuals. Uh, so some have to sit it out to um, not use the resource. so others can benefit. But of course, that's not gonna happen naturally. So this will end up capturing the tragedy of the commons. <clears throat> so I'll, again, I'll write out the payoff matrix in a second, but the basic idea here is like freeway um, traffic during rush hour. Um, in principle, everyone wants to get home faster, and so everybody wants to use the freeway. That's the hawk solution. That's the aggressive solution. But if everyone uses the freeway, it creates so much congestion that the freeway becomes as slow or slower than the side streets. So really in order for the freeway to provide benefit, 
You need some people to elect to take the side streets, knowing that they're going to get home slower than those who, uh, who got the benefit of the freeway. So we don't have a good way of deciding who gets to benefit from the freeway and who doesn't. And so because there's no way of saying you get the benefit and you don't, that everybody's gonna try to benefit. And that creates this tragedy where the more people using the freeway, the less benefit those people using the freeway get. And you end up degrading the whole freeway. You may as well not even have a freeway, just have side streets. And that's the tragedy of the commons. And that's captured by the Hawk Dove. And so um, the Hawk Dove is usually written out. Um, so the stag hunt, the two player stag hunt is like the simplest public goods game you could get. It's a little hard to sometimes even see how it's a public goods game. That's why I introduced the in player stag hunt, which is like the generalization of the two player, the arbitrary number of players. And then it starts looking like a public good game. This hawk dove is like the simplest version of a tragedy of the commons. It's like, <clears throat> and, it's, and that's why it's sometimes hard to see how it's a tragedy of the commons. It's like you take a tragedy of the commons and you uh, reduce it down to its bare minimum. How could you have a tragedy of the commons with only two people? That would be the hawk dove. And so um, we either talk about it, either call it hawk dove or chicken game. So if it's hawk dove, Uh, then um, I'm going to have two uh, strategies. Um, I'm going to say I'll put dove on the left this time. Dove versus hawk. Hawk is an aggressive strategy. Hawks, when they fight each other, it's very costly. But when hawks fight doves, the hawk always wins, and it's not very costly to the hawk, and it's very costly to the dove. So I play uh, dove, hawk. And so I put these in boxes here. And so the idea here is that um, if two doves play each other, that's like side street, side street, they both tie in this uh, competitive. Um, so the so hot chicken, this is a more competitive interaction. So when uh, two doves play each other, they both tie, that's what T is. When a hawk plays a dove, the dove loses and the hawk wins. Similarly, when a dove plays a hawk in the other direction, the dove wins, or sorry, the hawk wins and the dove loses. When two hawks play each other, then um, it's, uh, you can think of it as an escalated fight where the cost of the fight will be greater than the benefits. Um, so I'm going to list that as an X. And so in general, we have that the, it's better to win than it is to tie, but it's better to tie than it is to lose. And it's better to lose as a dove than lose as a hawk. So that's something I'll maybe put here. Better to lose as dove than lose as hawk. <laughs> so you would much rather be a dove playing a hawk than a hawk playing a hawk. So, but you'd much rather be a hawk playing a dove than a dove playing a dove. Um, and so um, one way we can set this up, if it's, if it's helpful to sort of imagine, um, you know, a situation here, imagine that um, if you had a resource um, with value V that you're fighting over. So if two doves fight over that resource, they get to split it. So um, in that case, um, what I'm going to say also right here that the cost of hawk hawk fight is C, which we're going to say is greater than V. So then if um, if two doves fight and tie, they get to split the resource, B divided by two. Um, if a dove plays a hawk, then the dove loses the resource completely. So L is equal to zero, but the hawk gets all of it. W is equal to B. But if a hawk plays another hawk, um, then in that case, 
um, they both pay a cost, and um, and that cost will end up dwarfing the resource. And so we could say that the uh, the cost here, I'll say that x is equal to um, I'll say c minus b divided by two. So um, or no, I meant to do it the other way around. B minus C divided by two. I don't really need the divided by two, but I'm just kind of showing that they're sharing this. So remember that you know the cost is greater than the value of the resource. So this is going to mean that X is less than zero. It's negative. And so this little scenario here sets up the Hawk Dove game. This is, I think, the typical way when biologists teach the hawk dove in terms of evolutionary biology and the uh, evolution of aggressive strategies and things. This is sort of the framing they use. This is a little bit more generic framing, and that's the mapping between the two. And so, um, so that's so. Does that make sense? That sort of framework there. So, if we are both doves, we split the resource. If we happen to play a hawk, we get zero. If um, so, if we want to cast this in terms of the freeway scenario. Um, if I can manage to get you to take the side streets and I take the freeway, I get all the value of the freeway. You get uh, none of the value of the freeway. In fact, um, and then you get criticized by whoever's waiting at home for you because you didn't take the freeway. So you actually get nothing out of it in this situation. But the person you let get in the freeway, they get home on time um, and get sold the value. If we both take the side streets, then there's no... You know, we both get home at a decent time and nobody complains that their neighbor got home sooner than them. So they get to split sort of the value there. Uh, but if we both decide to take the highway, then it's so costly because of the negative externality. My me going on the highway creates congestion for you. And that means that both of us are in gridlock or in deadlock. So they just, so we get to getting stuck there and it takes even longer to get home. And that's how we end up getting negative. So that's how the hawk dove models this kind of tragedy of the commons. Is that clear? The other framing that people use is the chicken framing, um, where um, I, it's basically the same thing. And so I won't write out the whole uh, matrix here, but instead of dove, it's swerve. And instead of um, a hawk, it's straight. So it's a little bit, you know, mixing some things here. It's another car metaphor. But, you know, so, you know, familiar with the game of chicken, you've got two individuals, um, you know, who are driving toward each other, and they can either go straight or they can swerve. Um, so there's the swerve and there's the straight option. And so if they both go straight, they get a collision, very bad. Um, if they both swerve, they both look bad. Um, so, but at least they live. So that's a tie. Um, and if one goes straight, the other one swerves. One who goes straight looks best. They win the outcome. And the one who swerves loses the outcome. So, but it's otherwise the same um, payoff matrix as this hot one. Any questions about that? Yeah. So if... And, and I'm just using the highway example because that one so sort of made sense to me. But um, if the the best option is for everyone to use the side streets, right? Um, because well, no, so that's the kind of interesting thing. So this is an anti-coordination game. So if you actually go through the math here, um, the the Nash equilibria are the two are these here. So there are. Um, I'll mention this is an anti-coordination game. Which basically means there are uh, two Nash and they correspond to opposing uh, or opposite, I guess, strategies. So maybe I'll highlight that in yellow to show that these are these are the two Nash strategies here. So we can kind of see here that if, um, if I'm playing Hawk, 
um, and the other one's playing dumb. Well, if the other one decides to, um, if if I'm playing um, hawk, and the other one plays, um, okay, right now, sorry, the other way around. Um, if if the other one's playing dove and is fixed at dove, and I'm playing hawk, I have no benefit, no reason to want to switch to playing dove. So if if this is the fixed row, so the row is fixed. The vertical player is playing dove. I'm playing hawk. I win. If I switch to play dove, I do worse in talk. Similarly, um, if we're down here and I'm playing dove and the other one's playing hawk, well, then at least as dove, um, I'm going to uh, get L, whereas if I switch, I'm going to get X. So the two Nash are these two corners here. But the problem is deciding who is going to play those two. And, um, and so that's, it, it's, a, it's, it's, not, it's a similar issue as in the coordination game. We have to agree who gets hawk and who gets dove. But there's no obvious way to break this symmetry. And that's the fundamental problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, now in, there is sort of an advanced concept, which I'm not gonna, you don't have to memorize or anything, but it just happens to be called, um, I think like a, a there's a uncorrelated equilibrium, which is like if um, if it happens to be that there is some background context that breaks the symmetry. For example, what if I already own about the, the, the resource? So the hot dub game is actually being played like who gets to use my field? Well, if I own my field already, then I'm going to defend my field. I'm just naturally going to play hot. And so that breaks it. So in that case, the, the invader um, it's their choice whether they want to you know, play hawk, but they know that the person that is defending the field is almost definitely going to play hawk. So in that case, that breaks the symmetry. Um, there are also, um, uh, it mentioned before, correlated equilibria. You can have a third party go in and give both parties a, a, an outcome where you can tell them, you know, you should play dove, you should play hawk. And if ahead of time they know the distribution of those outcomes, like if whoever is told to play hawk, they know that the other person will be told to play dove. But whoever is told to play dove, they only know that the other person could have been told to play dove or hawk. If we agree that that's the third party's rules, that if I get hawk, the other one's going to get dove, but if I get dove, I don't know what the other one did, there is no incentive to do anything but what I've been recommended to do. And so just like a stoplight, a correlated equilibrium can break uh, the hawk dove symmetry. But without either of those things, a natural background context that establishes that who's going to play hawk or not, or a third party that gives these recommendations, which basically helps prevent the hawk hawk outcome, then um, you're stuck, you know, not knowing what to do with this asymmetry. So um, it, there's a third solution to the hawk dove which I mentioned briefly when I talked about the in-player stack, is that uh, typically um, when we talk about the hawk dove, there is a mixed Nash, which um, has a fraction of the population plays hawk, and the rest play dove. And it is outside the, so this can be solved for. So if a fraction depends on payoffs, and, um, and this, uh, you know, can be solved for, but it's outside the scope of this class. It's more mathematical. Um, so if you're ever interested in taking a course on game theory or optimization, you might go through this off, but, but for, for this class, I just want you to know there is a mixed solution. And what's interesting about this is that this is a, is a Nash equilibria that has a type of stability to it, which um, if one more, so it's basically, um, so you can imagine, for example, uh, there could be like 64% play hawk and the other 36% play dove. 
And, um, and so you can imagine that you get random draws from a population. You and you, um, let's have you fight. And, um, and if you play hawk, you play dog, you know, that's what the outcome is going to be. Um, if there, you get slightly more hawks in the population, it becomes too costly to be a hawk because you will just by chance, just by this demographics here, get into too many fights with a hawk to make it worth it to be a hawk. And so it actually becomes even better for whoever the hawk was to die out and a new dub to come in. Likewise, if there are too few hawks, it becomes really beneficial for a new hawk to come into the population because since there are too few hawks, hardly anybody is playing the hawk hawk strategy and there's a bunch of doves and you can just mow down. So, um, so that's kind of the interesting thing about this mixed strategy, which is how in nature, um, it seems like this sort of describes aggressive, like the, the sort of balance between, like imagine the gene for aggression, uh, how many people in the population are going to get the aggressive allele, how many people are going to get the passive allele, well, that could be described by this, and the population genetics that would come out of that would end up suggesting that you get a certain fraction would get aggressive, a certain fraction would get passive, and it would be frequency dependent. And so if you tried to perturb that, so if there were a, a sudden influx of a much more passive or a sudden influx of a much more aggressive, after a short amount of time, a few generations, it would go back to this equilibrium strategy. So that's sort of the more realistic outcome of hawk dove games is you get fractions of individuals. And that actually kind of makes sense even in the highway example is that um, in reality, you don't get, um, you know, everyone trying to use the highway, you get some people who just say, I'm going to take the side streets. I don't like to drive on the highway anyway. Uh, it's too congested. Um, and then you get other people that, you know, really want to drive on the highway. And so if you were to sort of say, what is your natural preference, drive the highway or the side streets? If we were to analyze that fraction, um, there's a good chance that it would be described by the outcome of a hawk dove game if you got the payoffs just right. So does that make sense? This idea that you've got a mixed Nash where it's actually best for the population, or in other words, if you don't like to think of the population, you can all you can think of this as um, the um, you can think of this population or probability an individual chooses the aggressive strategy hawk. So you could either say there's 64% of people always go on the highway, or you could say um, everyone in the population, uh, for each individual, 64% of the time they choose to take the highway, and the other 36% of the time they choose to take the side streets. And so you can either view mixed equilibria as, um, as like a randomness in each individual, or you can view it as a mixture across a population of pure strategy. How we interpret it's two ways to interpret mixed matches. So, questions about that, about potential outcomes of these uh, externalities, these negative externalities. So, the hawk dove um, example of where the more people using the resource is worse for everyone. The stag hunt is an example of more people using the resource being better for everyone. And so um, it's, you know, one's a coordination game where everybody needs to be doing the same thing. That's the Nash. Another one's an anti-coordination game where it's better, um, where it's, it's more beneficial for each individual if, if someone else. So I guess that's, that's really what you say about the Nash. The Nash in the Hawk Dub is it's better for me if you do something else. In the Stag Hunt, it's better for me if you also play the Stag. So the Nash in the stag hunt is we should do the same thing. The Nash in the uh, hawk dove is we should be doing different things. Yeah. What's the risk in playing stag in like a public goods problem, like the like public radio? Like what's the... Well, the risk in the public radio thing is I might donate to public radio, and if not enough people donate, the radio station goes off the air. Loss. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. All right, any other comments on that sort of thing? But I want to make sure we got through that. I want to make sure we saw that externalities are really important. When you get down to these simple models 
of social behavior, understanding externalities is super, super important. And that, uh, the reason I structured this right in front of the networks unit is that when economists talk about externalities, um, they have another term for that. So externalities um, to economists are sometimes called network effects. Emphasis on this network idea. And it's, so it's sort of like the idea is like, for example, um, imagine, um, you know, phones or even, um, uh, you know, other communication, social networks. Um, then the idea here is that uh, I don't get any value for a phone, for having a cell phone, if no one else has a phone. You derive value in a resource based on how many other people are using that resource. So, um, so these are examples here of positive externalities where you can imagine if my, um, you know, if I, this is like, um, imagine different ways, different people all having access to this phone system. Um, you know, I'm trying to draw all the possible connections here. So in this case here, um, few possible connections. But down here, there's many possible connections. In fact, for every um, n number of people, there are n squared connections. So as more people get a cell phone or get a phone, then the potential benefit grows at a much higher rate. And so this is an example of a positive externality where the benefit is coming from the network. It's coming from these network effects. And then similarly, we can talk about negative network effects like the congestion network, um, where the more people that are using the resource um, are degrading the benefit for everyone else. Um, and so, um, you know, this idea of uh, that the benefits to an individual depend upon how many other people are participating in the system is a simple example of why networks matter. And so this kind of motivates that, you know, that, you know, what other macro scale uh, patterns occur uh, due to network effects. And that's our motivation for this unit. Unit All right. All right. So, um, as you guys are reading through, how many people, I guess, were familiar with the six degrees of separation and heard of that? Okay, good. Right. So that's pretty, pretty common. Uh, spreads very quickly over over the network, I suppose. Um, and uh, so, any um, any observations or specific questions uh, um, that sort of came up? Or I saw some people were um, sort of discouraged by the fact that Milgram's original experiment on six degrees of separation um, ended up being kind of problematic. It had a lot of ascertainment bias, uh, but um, you know, there are some other sort of interesting observations I saw in perusal. Any, any comments or questions from the, the two chapters that I want to make sure we get to before we make sure that everybody's got the definition of the network's fundamentals? Yeah, I had, a, I had a question, but I'm trying to remember what it is. So okay. Well. All right. Sounds good. So, um, so yeah. That, so this, so this chapter, I thought it was, it was good. You know, that she started with um, this. You know, this, so there's this psychologist uh, Stanley Milgram who has has actually had a number of problematic experiments 
um, where uh, uh, I don't, it's not that Milgram was a, I, I think he ended up being just a very provocative researcher. Um, there was, I don't think anything that was in the, in the realm of research misconduct, but, uh, but it's just sort of like getting known for a lot of, of, uh, of uh, results that ended up either being problematic in their aftermath or problematic in their interpretation. Yeah, did you? Yeah, I, um, so talked about a little, about like in degree stuff, mm -hmm. um, and I just sort of didn't really understand what that meant, I guess. All right, we'll, we'll, I'll define that explicitly here in just a second. All right, so how, what was Milgram's letters the experiment? Um, does anybody sort of summarize what he did there? Yeah. He sent out a whole bunch of letters and saw how long it would take for those letters to reach. Uh, I think it was awesome. Well, did, well so do you remember, did, did he send them out? Or what was the, uh, the they're more fine-grained like in his methodology there? I think he, he did something. He didn't like mail them out, but he sort of gave them to specific people with specific instructions. You're supposed to give them to someone that you felt you were close with, um, and then you measured how many people received those letters, and he said that on average it was like five. Right, right. So, so yeah. So he had a couple of targets. So he had sort of target um, individuals, and um, and so we knew that they had locations and occupations were known, and um, and then he basically then gave letters to source individuals um, with instruction to pass to people they know to ultimately reach targets. And then, um, and then as so then he sort of could keep track of all the hops there. And so once it got to the targets, then he looked at all the letters that were received and, um, and said that, you know, on average, we had about, you know, five hops uh, for each letter or across, you know, well, just average, you know, five hops across uh, received letters. And, um, and this sort of helped kind of, this sort of became the six degrees of separation uh, or the, um, what some other people call uh, the small world where, um, you know, large number of people have few connections between them. Now, of course, it's a problematic result because the one who found out that a bunch of letters that got sent out didn't actually get received. So what is that, like an infinite number of hops? So that would sort of, you know, change the, the average here. So there are these sort of what we call censoring effects sometimes, or maybe a little bit of ascertainment bias or sampling bias in this calculation. Other people sort of did this um, again, maybe with a little bit of better methodology, it found that the average number of hops was maybe larger than five. So maybe it isn't really six degrees of separation, but still this idea, the, the myth, I guess, is, the, is what Mitchell said, is that it really did seem like um, that everyone is, uh, is, is close to someone else, um, relatively speaking. Now, it could just be coincidence, like whenever you happen to bump into somebody who neighbor knows your best friend from elementary school or something like that, it might be you just remember that more often. And those things happen by coincidence every once in a while, but they're the only things that stay in your memory. So it seems like they're very common. So it could just be coincidence or not. And so that's really, you know, one of the things that network science uh, was hoping to solve is, um, is really a study, you know, does this happen? And then how and why, the causal questions behind it. Um, you know, that's sort of the, the motivation behind network science. 
And so if we can build simple models that very quickly lead to small world networks, that probably gives us some confidence that yeah, maybe there really are small world networks. But if it's really hard for us to get simple models um, where we haven't even like, you know, created a bunch of confounding variables or whatever that, that could create these small world connections, then it's hard to imagine that in reality, these things really actually happen. And so, um, so people like Steve Strogatz, Duncan Watts, um, uh, uh, Laszlo uh, Albert Barabashi, um, there, you know, these are sort of these sort of famous names in network science that aim to sort of provide rigorous background for, for this. And so, um, you know, network science or network thinking is based on primarily graph theory, an area of mathematics, plus a bunch of other useful tools like statistics and some other things. Um, in fact, quite a bit of statistical mechanics that we learned about earlier in the semester. Um, so we're going to focus just on the graphs. So, you know, a graph, we often say, is the combination of, um, of nodes and links. And sometimes we call the nodes vertices or vertexes, vertices and edges, those are just sort of synonyms. Um, and so, um, you know, a node is just anything that shows up in the graph and a link is any relationship between the nodes. So um, here we've got you know, four nodes, and we've got one, two, three, four, five links. And this is going to get to the in degree, out degree in a second. And these are what we call undirected links. So as an example, we could create a network um, of everyone who's been in this room today, or everyone who's seen me today. And um, it would have, you know, maybe me, and then each one of you would be a node in that network, and you would have a link maybe to me. Um, and so in that case, that would be people, and then their links are some relationship. And that relationship could just be, I saw that person today, I had the opportunity to saw the person today. It could be something more specific. I spoke with that person today. Um, you know, you know there, I, could I ate lunch with that person today? Um, so there could be particular actions. We, we have to define what these links are. Um, it is up to us what these links are. So there's no concrete definition of what a link is. It's any relationship that you think is important to keep track of is one of those, uh, those links there. And when we say they're undirected, then that means that you don't care about um, whether, like you could say that if I told you something, there should be a link from me to you. If you told me something, there should be a link from you to me. So, um, so this is an undirected graph, and I'm going to draw the directed graphs next. But for the undirected graph, I'm going to then also mention that we've got this term degree, which is just the number of links at a node. And so, um, you know, A has got a degree of two, B has got a degree of three, C has got a degree of two, and D has got a degree of three. And so this is for the undirected symmetric link case where we don't care about where, you know, how the relationship happened, A to B, B to A, we'll get to that in just a second, but we just care that there was a relationship. So are there any questions about these terms? So the big terms here, um, things like nodes or vertices, links or edges, um, a degree, um, and this idea of undirectedness. That makes sense. Okay. So the other type of network that we're gonna see are directed graphs.
And um, this would just say, you know, links have direction. So you can have a similar network as before that I drew, but you might have that A circles around them. Um, a might have a, a link to B, and B might have a link back to A, but B might only have an outward link to D and not the other way around. C might have a link to D, and C might have a link to B. Um, and so each one of these might say that, like, you know, um, you know, A shared info with B. B shared info with A. And so that's the reason why you've got, um, so I can highlight you know, A shared info with B, that's this one. B shared info with A, that's this one. And so now we've got directionality in the relationships. And so this is what I mean by a directed graph. So now that we've got links that are different, we need degrees that are different. And so that's when we define um, an in degree, which is number of incoming links, and then out degree. is number of outgoing links. And so for this example here, if I, if I said like A, B, C, and D, I can list their in degree, maybe down this column, and their out degree, maybe down this column. And so for A, I see it's got one incoming link from B. It's got one outgoing link to B. B has got one, uh, two incoming links. Correct me if I'm wrong. B has got two outgoing links. C has got two outgoing links and no incoming links. And D has got two incoming links and no outgoing links. And that's in degree and out degree. So any questions about that? Does that help with your question earlier? So later in the chapter, they talk about web pages. And so we can talk about one web page links to another web page, but the other one doesn't link back to it. So like, you know, a bunch of faculty web pages might link to ASU, but ASU doesn't necessarily link back to them. So, the, so if you link to another web page, maybe that's an outlink from one web page to another. Um, and so you might have some web pages will have a lot of incoming links and very few outcoming links. So very popular web pages will have very income, a lot of incoming links and no outgoing links. And maybe not so popular pages will only have outgoing links and no income links. So directionality can really matter depending on what type of network we're looking at. Yes. Yeah. So in that case, I don't really understand why when they included the example of Google, why Google decided to only focus on the income links mm. as opposed to the out? Wouldn't it be more beneficial to do both? Uh, well, so, and now I'd say when you search on Google now, things are a lot more complicated, but the original uh, page rank algorithm was as Mitchell described, and it was a little bit of a hunch. So um, does, does anybody, anybody use a search engine before Google? i show you my, so before Google, there were a lot of other search engines and they all were not, that great. So there's Alta Vista, uh, Yahoo, there's a bunch of others that, that just, just that whatever you search, it's kind of like Mitchell was saying, is that if you typed in text, they basically would show you all the pages that showed that text. And they would come up with some way to sort them. Like if that text occurred more than once or whatever, then, you know, but they, they just weren't very good at sorting. So when, um, what uh, like Larry Page and, and so on, um, and certainly Brin came up with is they said, we need a new way to differentiate between popular pages, not popular pages. And on a hunch, they said, it seems like pages that are very relevant, so we can just cut the Google page right here. Just mention it now. Um, is that there was a hunch that popular relevant pages 
would have, would always have many more incoming links in degree than other searches, other matching results. And it's just was a hunch, a hypothesis to be tested, really, um, that, that really the hypothesis there is that in degree uh, or popularity is sort of determines in degree. Um, and if that's the case, then the hypothesis, the experiment to test that hypothesis was that, well, if we build a search engine that where people search for things and we sort them by in degree, then the best results are going to come out of that search engine relative to another search engine uses some other scheme. That's what happened. That's why Google became dominant. So it could have turned out the other way. And that's something that um, towards the end of this chapter is that, um, is that, you know, Mitchell mentions that and we'll define this here in a second, but this works um, sort of because the web is a, um, you know, scale free network, which we'll just fly here in just a second. So if the web were some other type of network where everyone links to everyone else, like if it was like an internal, like an intranet or something like that, where there were very few pages that were kind of like, like, like every page was sort of similarly used and they all like linked to it or some weird, weird sort of thing where like there's always a table of contents on the left hand side and so every page always links to every other page. In that weird case, we're like searching through a book. If, if every page of your digital book links to every other page, this would be a terrible strategy because every page has the same number of inlinks. That's not how the web works. In the web, um, it just tends to be that really good pages um, get a lot of people linking to them. And so if you sort by in degree, then it turns out that their hunch, their hypothesis, it turned out to be probably right, was well supported, and Google became the dominant search engine because these results were much more preferable to people than everything else. I mean, it was like a night and day difference when, uh, and, you know, then other search engines tried to innovate as well, you know, and, but you know, then it was a success to the successful rich kid richer, you know, like Bing and the rest of them, even though they might have used a similar page rank, uh, Google had the biggest database and they knew how to use it well and the quickest and so on. And that's why Google has continued to be dominant because no one else really has figured out a better way to do search just yet. I'm not saying they won't, maybe they will. I mean, fundamentally we're changing the way we're using the internet. Now we have apps for the web and so on and so forth. But at least while the web becomes such a huge source of information, this hunch seems to pay off. And it still is very influential in the way uh, results are ranked, aside from advertising. Yeah. Well, I'd say that how to use like a yeah, pheromone type. Well, and there are, for other search problems, people actually do do those sort of physically embodied things. Um, I actually went to a transportation conference once where, um, where people were actually putting sort of computers in the infrastructure. And as people would drive down the road, they would lay virtual pheromones on like um, in little counters in these computers that were embedded within the infrastructure. And based on the virtual pheromone counts, on those little billboards that show up above the roads, it would tell people that right now, um, actually it's made better for you to go this other path uh, because um, it turns out that it's almost like an anti-pheromone thing. There's just way too much virtual pheromone here. So if you wanna get around, like actually it's better to go the other way. Um, but like in the case of the, the web, I mean, if you wanna think about it, the, the links out are sort of like a type of pheromone, but they're a pheromone that, Without Google, we can't perceive. But that's what Google did. It said, I'm going to crawl the entire web and I'm going to say, you know, web page A has got uh, 50 links coming into it. Web page B has got 5 million links coming into it. Um, web page C, et cetera. So um, we couldn't see what web pages were even feasible, what matched our search, and we couldn't see how many links came into it. But now that we have Google, it's almost like Google allows us to smell the number of links and drive us to the one with the strongest smell. So yeah, you could think that Google was kind of implementing a pheromone trail, but instead of taking social data 
from the searchers, it's like they're taking social data from the content producers and then giving it to the searchers. And that happens in work again because of the scale free property that we'll talk about in just a second here. So, any other questions about the in link, out link sort of thing? Or about page rank, this sort of famous algorithm that revolutionized search? Um, yeah, so. So since we've talked about so you know, the two other kind of big network things that we need to make sure that we you know about is that there is this property on networks called clustering. Um, did anybody remember roughly what a, a cluster was? If you have good, good basic definition. Um, so the, 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 uh, the idea behind the cluster here was it's a group of people, a group of nodes that what? So what's special about the individuals in this subset of nodes? Yeah. They're linked with other nodes in the cluster. Yeah, they're primarily linked with other nodes in the cluster. So primarily linked to other cluster nodes. So it's, uh, there is, um, if you were ever, um, to, if you ever download a data set that you have to analyze for social network analysis, you're gonna find a bunch of tools that it will, uh, that any statistical tool that knows how to deal with network data will, will give you. And one of them allows you to calculate something called a clustering coefficient. And this is how you calculate this outside of the scope of this class. It doesn't really matter. But the big point here is that um, it basically, if it's high, then uh, most links are within cluster. And if it's low, then there are few links within, um, you know, candidate cluster so it's not a cluster of Islam. so basically i can go through a um, social network and i can say are these people over here a cluster like i might hypothetically i want to test a hypothesis that um that everyone in the same cohort who started at asu in the school of sustainability the same year um, tend to be those who take classes together so i could build a network of who takes classes together and I could test that. I'm going to isolate all the nodes that started the same semester and see if they tend to take classes together. And if they have a high clustering coefficient, then I know that those are a cluster that stay together. Uh, but if they have a low clustering coefficient, I've kind of rejected my hypothesis. And then I might have to then say, well, then what's the other thing that could explain how these clusters will form? So it's a way we can measure kind of these clusters. So that's a term you should know what will be my clustering. Um, the, the, the sort of the, the highest cluster, so the, the sort of like uh, the most clustery cluster is called a clique. A clique. So the most clustery, that's most clustery cluster is a clique, which is like where it's just a module where they only talk to each other. I don't really talk anyway. All right, so those are some, some good terms to know. Um, the other important thing we need to know about is the degree distribution. So, um, so this is a frequent thing that you plot on when you gather network data. And it's just a histogram where you've got degree, and this could be um, degree or in degree or out degree. Usually in degree is sort of a, um, more interest and frequency. So it's how often this occurs. And so um, we could say, you know, uh, these are all my degree options here. So I'll just write a few. Um, maybe we'll stop there and then we'll jump ahead. And let's say way out here, there's a degree of 100. And then it 
can keep going. Um, and then the uh, each one of these, so I'll just draw it as a here. This represents how many nodes only have one link. And you know, I might then this would be how many nodes have two links, how many nodes have three links, four links, five links, uh, six links, maybe um, it goes to zero for a while. And then suddenly I get a small number of nodes that maybe have 100 links. And so um, when you have, so for one, uh, this distribution, these distributions are very often, um, this is an example of what we call a skew distribution that has high skewness. And that uh, basically means that um, there are, it has a tail. So it's not symmetric. So instead of having all of your degrees here, you've got most of them here and then a long tail where there are some nodes that have a lot higher degrees. And so if you have several, if you have nodes way out here, um, this uh, that are, um, this can be called a fat tail if frequencies stay um, appreciable for high numbers. And in this particular case, when you have um, nodes, very few nodes with extremely high connections, then we refer to those as hubs. So few nodes with many, many links. So important terms here, degree distribution, super important. Um, hubs for this class, uh, super important. Um, those are kind of the two really big ones, but when you hear people talk about these distributions, you'll often hear them talking about skewed distributions, meaning they're asymmetric. You'll hear them talk, when, they, when there are hubs, you'll often hear them talking about fat tails, which just means that instead of the tail like plummeting to zero very quickly, um, it sort of stays high and you'll end up getting a large number of these out a relatively large number of them so any questions about the degree distribution this is often used because like uh, well if we think we know how a network is formed we might in a, a simulation build a network using that process and once we get the network, we can look at its degree distribution. And if its degree distribution doesn't look like the degree distribution we see in nature, then we know that our process of forming that network was probably wrong. So we often use degree distributions um, as measurable, sort of quantifiable metrics of network agreement. So if this network process matches the real process, the degree distribution should match. Questions about that? Is that pretty clear if you've got redistribution? All right, and then that brings us to kind of the last two things that I want to make sure that we kind of cover here is that another important property of these um, is that uh, the path link, which is the minimum number of hops between any two nodes. And then from that, we can have an average path length, which is a, you know, a property of the network. So the path length is a property of every pair of nodes. Um, and then the average path length is a property of the network. And with that, we can finally formally quantify 
what it means to be a small world network. So a small world network has the small world property. And the small world property um, is just that we have relatively few Uh, long distance connections, but a small but a small average path length. And so the idea is if you're forming a network, um, you could form a network based on distance, for example. So if uh, if I wanted to um, tell you that uh, a certain, you know, there's a change in the exam format. I can tell one of you and count on that one of you telling another one of you and telling another one of you that it might take, you know, 20 hops for everyone and for everyone to finally get the, the news. Now, a long distance connection would be that, um, that even though I might only see one of like anybody who didn't come to class today, they would have to wait for one of you to, to speak with them. But a long distance connection would be that anybody who doesn't come to class, why well, just use Canvas? And so that gives me a way of having a connection that regardless of space, I can directly send information. Now, if they're also passing information around, that will shorten the gap between them and everyone else. That's what we mean by a long distance connection. And so a small world network um, has an average path length that's low, even though the size of the network is very large. Um, and uh, there aren't, it, there's not all to all connections. And so one cheap way to make fast communication is for each one of us to have an all to all connection. But uh, a more efficient way would be uh, one is that have a, a some number of, number of people having long distance connections that shortcut things. And so it turns out that um, you only need a very small number of shortcuts to create, get this small world up. Why don't we keep uh, to so what we're going to so next time we're going to primarily so I'm going to I'm going to transition from networks to resilience with an optional paper that I put both this lecture and next lecture. Um, so next lecture back to Walker and Saul. Um, I'll start <clears throat> with a couple of comments on why small world networks are potentially good and why uh, real networks tend to be scale free, which is a type. A small world network. So that's what we'll do next at the beginning. So I think we'll catch right up. <laughs> All right, so with that, uh, attendance slide here. Uh, we'll, uh, I've done this in a couple of lectures. So um, let's say that what is the name of a node that has far more links than all other nodes in the network. The name of node that has far more links than other nodes in the network. And then don't forget, last reading through Thursday, Simon H, I didn't turn in until Wednesday at 11.59. We'll see you Thursday.